we'll go ahead and get started. Greetings, everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Polish, and I serve as the Clean Energy Resource Team's uh, statewide director. I'm based at the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. We are super delighted to have you all here this afternoon. Um, this is a, a longer workshop focused on um, energy storage and particularly around battery storage technologies. And this is actually the third in a series of events that we have hosted with the Institute on the Environment and have organized with Akisha Everett of the Institute on the Environment. Um, Akisha has been central <laughs> to a multi-year project led by the Institute on the Environment around energy storage. And the guide, which is called the Community Scale Energy Storage Guide, has been a big part of this project that has been funded by uh, the LCCMR fund. So it's the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. In addition to the guide, which we're gonna preview with all of you today and share afterward, there have been three pilot projects underway that are really digging into and testing sort of how do these different technologies work? How do we align technologies with what are called use cases. And we're gonna talk a lot about that notion about what is a use case and why does that matter? Um, and I just wanna quickly highlight that the project partners who have been these sites include Renewable Energy Partners, led by Jamez Staples, President and CEO, along with Michael Krauss and Nate Broadbridge, who's on our call today. Um, the University of Minnesota Morris Campus, led by Brian Herman and Troy Goodnow, whom you will see later in a video. And the Red Lake Nation Government Center, led by the Tribal Council and Robert Blake, whom you'll see in a video later, and Ralph Jacobson, who is joining us today. Um, we are super excited to have folks who represent these projects and also really excited to be able to have some case studies of other folks who have also been doing other storage projects because we don't want you to think that there are only three storage projects underway in Minnesota. Indeed, there are many, many more, and you're gonna hear about some other examples and some of the learning from that. Um, thank you so much to Heidi Reese and Aaron, where did you go? <laughs> Who are both here, there's Aaron Hansen um, from Institute on the Environment. Thanks both of you for being here. We are really, I mean, quite sad that Akisha could not join us today because she really has spearhead so much of this project and the writing of this guide. Um, but she sends you all her best regards. Um, and we'll be following up with more from Akisha um, on the guide as well. So with that, um, I wanna just quickly touch base about how the afternoon is gonna go. We're starting with a few case studies because we want you to all just start getting familiar right away with, okay, so what is this looking like on the landscape? Who's doing projects? Why are they doing them? How have they designed those projects? What does it look like? And then we're gonna go into a little bit more depth about the guide and some of the content therein that can help you think about how would that lead me to develop my own steps and best practices for how I'm gonna move forward. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the different costs that influence the cost of a system, all of the different factors that might influence that and talk a little bit about financing. And then we're gonna close this afternoon um, with something that often we would do at an in-person meeting. We're gonna to try to do it on Zoom as well. We're gonna have you think about a couple of questions and reflect on those to help you think about, okay, so if I was thinking about storage for my own project, my own community, what is the use case that I want to consider have you have a little bit of time to think about that. And then we're gonna break into small groups. It'll be groups of five or so. These are not high stakes <laughs> conversations. It's really getting you to just sort of step through some of what you're thinking and hear what other folks in the you know, workshop are thinking about their own use cases to help you frame up where do you go from here. And, and the guide is really gonna be an essential component of that. I'm gonna briefly share with you my screen so that you can see the table of contents. Um, I will tell you all that one of the things that I think is most exciting about this guide is how user friendly it is. Um, it really breaks down and you can see there's the section called the benefits of energy storage. 
as well as energy storage batteries. And it includes here thermal storage, which isn't how people normally think about a battery, but we'll come to that a little, little bit later. But the thing I want to tee up is that in this framing of the benefits of energy storage, this is really talking about what is the use case? What is it that you're trying to accomplish with storage? Because what you're trying to accomplish necessarily informs what kind of technology you're going to need. It also informs how big that system will be. And there are certainly opportunities to have a primary need and a secondary need and then stack those as people refer to it. But I, I think that that use case, and you can see here, probably you can't see it as well. If I made it bigger, you could see better. There you go. <laughs> Hopefully that's a little easier on the eye. It highlights the four primary use cases, thinking about backup power and resilience, optimization of distributed generation. So that could be, in many cases that you'll hear about today, it'll be solar, but that could be wind or some sort of other distributed generation. Time of use rate management. So shifting when you're using power by storing up, you know, something that you might generate from your solar resource so that you can use it later when the sun goes down and or demand management. And so demand management would be to say, I'm trying to avoid a 15 minute demand interval, or as you might hear um, from Julie Kennedy, I'm really trying to think about avoiding some transmission charges or something like that, right? So thinking about how do I shift um, so that I'm not using energy at those peak times. And those are really the use cases that I want you to start thinking about as we get going with our presentations today because that's gonna help you then think about what is my use case. Another use case, um, not explicitly called out in this list of four is for folks who are just really thinking about wanting to go off grid. Um, and so we'll probably touch on that a little bit. So I'm gonna stop sharing there. Um, as we go, let me quickly reiterate that we will be recording the session. We will send you the recording later. We will be sharing slides from our presenters um, and as you have questions, you can just feel free to pop them right into the chat. Um, and I believe without further ado, we will dive right in. So we're gonna start with a couple of case studies. Um, we are super excited to have Allison Hoxie here to kick us off. Um, Allison is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth's Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering. We have known Allison for years. She has been a long-term member of our Northeast CERT steering committee. And years ago, Allison um, got involved in a project at the Hartley Nature Center and thinking about battery storage technologies. And at the time, Allison, was this the only project perhaps that was in the state? Is that possible? Uh, there were other battery, but it was the first retrofit. Um, ah, solar yeah. retrofit with adding a battery. So the solar panels were already there, which is a little bit unique. <laughs> and maybe a little bit more complicated. Yes. <laughs> uh, but perhaps not unlike some of the use cases that other folks are thinking about today. So with that, Maggie, if you will pull up Allison's slides. Allison, thanks so much for being here. We're super excited to have you talk about some of the research that you've been doing, what you've been finding, and sort of what this experience might highlight for other folks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk about the project that we did at Hartley Nature Center um, that you, as a professor at UMD, um, we did with a local nonprofit called Equilibrium 3. And that's why we have, um, this is a presentation and project that I collaborated closely with, with Brett Pence. So as many of you know, UMD is a land grant university. Um, in the city of Duluth, we have around 11,000 students and over 500 full-time faculty. Am I seeing, are you, we're still working on getting this in presentation mode, right? I'm not behind. Right, just, yeah, feel free to keep going and Maggie will keep trying to advance as she tries okay. to get it to pull yeah, up. Yeah, so Equilibrium 3 is a local nonprofit that helps with a lot of um, social, justice energy health issues in Duluth and they had a grant from um, the um, I think it was NSF solar market pathways to help bring solar to our community and so this was part of that project as well. Um, Hartley Nature Center itself is actually in a city owned building 
Um, it's a very energy efficient building. I think you want to go back one, but um, and it's a nonprofit that's operated out of this out of this building. It hosts a lot of school programs um, to help students, you know, get to know more about the natural environment. It also has a preschool, and it just turns out that that lower <laughs> little girl in the yellow sweat uh, sweater is my daughter oh, of course she's 10 right now but um and so i was connected to harley because you know my kids went there and um got sort of pulled in through that direction as well anyway you can go to the next slide so um hartley nature center was one of the first pv systems in northern minnesota it was installed in 2002 and there's 11 kilowatts on the roof and then they have a two kilowatt ground mounted dual access tracker. Um, the whole system has six inverters, uh, but by 2016, four of the five roof inverters were no longer operating uh, and replacing them would have been quite expensive. Uh, would have simply just replacing the inverters by themselves would have been around $10,000. So we looked at um, a way that we could maybe add value to Hartley Nature Center and also help them get funding for the inverters. So that's when we started looking at the possibility of adding battery storage uh, to their system as an upgrade overall. Um, there was all there's also been a, there was also a lot of other energy work being done at the at the on the building at the same time. So it was a good time to look at this stuff. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is just our project team. We had a lot of help from the city. Obviously, it's a city-owned building. Um, and we worked really hard with um, Minnesota Power and also Chris LaForge out of Wisconsin of Great Northern Solar. He was one of the first designers. He was the one who helped design the original system. So he came back and was an awesome um, addition to the team. So next slide, please. These are just some of our partners. Um, we did get some funding from the Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. Clean Energy Group, um, Minnesota Power, UMD, all these people helped out quite a bit. The goals were to replace those inverters that weren't working. Um, and this gets to the use case scenario. We had many ideas of what we were hoping to see, what we could accomplish with this battery. Um, we wanted to create a public emergency shelter so that people could come and power their phones and things like that if there were an outage. Uh, we wanted to move, the building was originally designed to be net zero, but has never operated at net zero. So we wanted to help move it towards that goal. Um, and we also wanted to really explore some of these other values that storage can bring. For instance, the critical load backup, they have a lot of animals and things like that in the, in the center. Um, but then also some of these behind the meter savings and, and mainly peak demand shaving. If we, and with our local utility, if you could get your peak demand below 10, um, kilowatts and under you know a certain usage per month i think it's 2500 kilowatts per month for three months then you get out of peak demand um and um half their electric bill is in peak demand and also to help um teach local installers how to do a battery storage project so as you'll see part of our process was we did a um, installation class so we looked at a bunch of different batteries. Um, we settled on Sunverge as being the best battery to fit the, the building load and the, and the price point. And also they had some software that really targeted on peak demand shaving. Um, and then we also added an SPS um, outlet from the one of the Sunny Boyd um, inverters. And all this means is it's a silly little thing, but like you can have a direct outlet to your solar panel. So if the sun's shining, you could plug in your um, device or whatever and charge it. However, you know, obviously if, if a cloud passes over, then power gets cut. So you have to be pretty careful with it. Okay, uh, yeah, next slide. So the ne first thing we did was we identified in what, what critical loads we would have the battery um, maintain if the grid did go down. So this included some emergency lighting, some outlets for for laptops and, and phone charging. It, uh, of course, you know, some of the animals in the exhibit hall, like Billy the Bass was on it, put on it. Um, and then just some basic things in their office area. So, yeah. So one of the considerations, maybe mention one more thing about that critical load. Um, one of the things you have to consider um, when you're looking at battery is obviously what critical loads you have, what, how much energy, 
you're going to need and what duration of time you want that power to be provided over. So that gets into that sort of total energy amount, but also um, rate, you know, energy use per time. Uh, so all those things went into our consideration. We did uh, install the battery as part of a class. So Chris LaForge came and um, taught installers how to do a retrofit like this. Uh, so there was a two and a half day class with, you know, probably like seven to eight installers um, that was held during the process. Okay, next. So this is just another picture of the class. Um, our mayor came on the day that we commissioned the battery. We ran the building on just the power of the battery and she declared it the storage, our solar plus storage awareness day in the city of Duluth. So we had a big party and it was pretty fun. Um, I just wanted to show a little bit about this software. The Sunverge software is very easy to use and actually had a master's student work with the software for the next you know, year to try and reduce um, peak demand charges. So as you can see, um, the solar is connected. If there's an excess of solar that the building's not using, it gets sent to the grid. Otherwise it'll charge the battery or it can go to an outlet and um, you could check it remotely, the battery remotely. So I'd sit in my office and say, oh, what's Hartley doing today? You know, how much energy are they consuming? Are they giving any back to the grid? And it's very, very convenient um, software process. Okay, so this is just showing a couple typical days. Um, and the main, I know this is a very busy graph. The, the one on the top is uh, per, per second, basically data. The one on the bottom is averaged over 15 minutes and that's what the power company sees in, in charges based on. So the really the line that I want you to pay attention to is the one that's kind of blue. It's, it's a straight flat line across, it goes across at 70. That was our target. We wanted to keep the, um, what the power company, what was drawn from the car, power company below that line. And the green line is the solar and the upper blue line is the battery. So what you're seeing is that even though on a per minute basis, a lot of times the, the, pull, the pull from um, the grid is above that target line, on average over 15 minutes, the battery would engage enough that we would keep it below our demand. Okay, next slide. So this is just another uh, example of that same, you know, sunny days, super easy, warm sunny days, not hard to stay below sort of that load level that we wanted to keep it below. Okay, next one. Here's a day where we don't, oop, go, yeah, here's a day where we don't have any sun. And you'll see that it, in the morning, there's always this, you know, de high demand when people are getting to the office, things are getting started up. And so here's just a really good case where the battery stepped in. Um, met the load of the building and it was able to keep the um, power consumption below our target rate. And then it was able to, this was a learning lesson too, is that in the afternoon then if you don't have sun and your battery only charges from your PV, it's not, the battery's not going to get charged up enough to do its, do its duty the next day. So we rewrote the algorithm so that it would charge um, from the grid if there was no sun and the building load was below the target. So there's all sorts of really fun things that you can do. I think it's super fun, but I'm an engineer. So <laughs> that you can do to play with the battery. Um, here's just another example of a day without solar where the battery was in major use and um, was able to you know, fairly well control the power consumption of the building, but we still had a little bit of an overage. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, lessons. Retrofits are hard. Uh, we had a lot of code updates and we were actually trying to get um, equipment that was like the first, the beta model of the equipment, the first time it was ever going to be used. Um, we were lucky that Minnesota Power was willing to work with us and, and um, you know, um, make it feasible to do this project. Uh, initial project estimates were around 20,000. They ended up around $45,000. But granted, this is several years ago now and battery costs have come down quite a bit. Um, Hartley out of pocket was only 5,000. So we were able to fund the rest through, this, through the grants and the, and the school. Um, one of the things that happened right before the battery showed up is Duluth had this severe windstorm and um, just a huge number of trees went down in Hartley. They had to close their K 
camps uh, for a week, which was a loss of about $10,000 to them because they didn't have power to their building. So if the battery had come just a week earlier, you know, they might have been able to avoid some of those um, cost shortages. Um, but, you know, otherwise, with the benefit of the battery itself, the payback was, you know, a 30 year payback with $1,500 benefit per year, but that doesn't add all these other you know, potential benefits. Um, they've had several outages since then and they didn't even notice because the battery just kicked in and they kept on working, just, you know, humming along until someone's like, why isn't this outlet not working? And they're like, oh yeah, the battery, the, the grid is down, but the battery's working. So it's been fun to follow up on and watch over the years. And with that, I'm done. Try to keep Thank it Thank you, Allison. No, that was super. And I'm sorry, I am sorry to everyone for the interruptions. Um, we've never actually had that happen in a certain meeting. So that's fun and exciting. We're, um, we're figuring it out. So here we go, right? Um, <laughs> thank you so much. That was actually, I mean, it's kind of fascinating, Allison, because I, I think that this sort of description of like lots of different use cases initially and trying to figure out like, how, how are we gonna do that and what's gonna work? And um, those examples of the graphs, yes, it's nerdy engineering, but I think the best kind of nerdy engineering so people can really get a handle on what it looks like. So thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, okay, with that, Maggie, you can just go right back to screen sharing because next up is Micah Johnson um, from Solar Connection based in Rochester. Um, Micah has also been a long time sort of steering committee member, but Micah is one of those folks who knows, I mean, anytime we have a, a clean energy question, if you have like a clean energy emergency and you have to phone a friend, um, Micah would be a good person to call. Um, Micah has done lots of presentations over the years um, for certs and for lots of other folks around solar, but increasingly around batteries. Um, and was a big part of a CERT seed grant funded project. There was lots of other funding beyond that, but with Quarry Hill Nature Center um, to really think about adding again, um, batteries to a, an existing storage system. Let me briefly plug for all of you that CERTs currently has a round of seed grants <laughs> open. Yay! Um, and we will put some information about that in the chat. But if you're thinking about projects that you know you might want to have, um, you know, funded through this kind of sea grant process, this is something to think about. Um, and Micah, my favorite thing um, that I'll just share as a fun fact is that Micah has this great um, quote at the bottom of his emails that reads, "Always do right. This will gratify some and astonish the rest." From Mark Twain. I love that, Micah. All right, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, sorry, there's, there may be a, a phone in the background. I'm at the office and, and these phones are unfortunately not mutable because it's, you know, 2021. And that makes sense. Uh, anyway, we did this uh, great project for Quarry Hill uh, Nature Center, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit, and I'll also uh, bring in some bonus info on uh, Warner Electric and Cottage Grove and the battery system that we didn't put in, but I, I got that permission to do so. Presentation. Anyway, Corey Hill is an absolute state treasure. Uh, we did the solar in 2017, I believe, is when we put the panels on the roof. And uh, next slide. They wanted to do a battery system, and they kind of knew that from the beginning, but uh, didn't have the funds for it when the when the project got uh, when the building went up. So they wanted to do a battery. We got a seed grant from CERTS. Uh, came back last summer to get the battery in. Next slide. Uh, Quarry Hill is a fascinating kind of collaboration between the school district, the city, and the county. And um, you can hit the next slide. Uh, because of that, how this collaboration works, they don't actually pay for their own power. It's the city. It's a contract with the city that pays for the power. So this, this absolutely couldn't have happened without a CERTS grant. And uh, really encourage anyone that's got a project to, to shoot an application for those. And they're, they're really good. Next slide. Um, like I said, they knew back in 2017 they wanted to eventually have a battery. We installed an inverter that could work with or without batteries. Back then, there were really only a couple of companies that could do this. Now it's it's much more common. Just about all the, the common residential inverter companies can offer this, and several commercial inverter companies are offering this um, now. So you can you can figure that out where I'm installing solar now and I'm going to add batteries in a few years or, or what have you. Uh, next slide. 
This is a lithium ion battery from LG Chem. They actually weigh 214 pounds. And uh, it's kind of fun. We, we uh, are installing this actually in the kitchen. Next slide. Uh, these, it's nice, the lithium batteries, there's, there's a whole section in the energy storage guide that these lithium batteries don't have any off-gassing compared to some of the batteries will do that. Uh, next slide. I do get asked about double A's once in a while. I'm not, not sure that there's really a use case for that. Next slide. That's my master electrician. As you can see, he's, he's really good. The site where uh, Quarry Hill is now was originally both a rock quarry and a hospital. So it's an interesting place to learn about both ancient and not, not so ancient history. For ancient history, you can fossil hunt in the old quarry. More recently, when the hospital closed, they literally dumped everything in the river. So people find all these artifacts from an 1800s hospital. Next slide. I wanted a picture of kind of how the Next slide, Maggie. Yeah, there. I wanted a picture of how the uh, battery kind of fits into the decor of the building, but I had uh, inadvertently set off the alarm. So I took this picture as I was running from the security guard. Next slide. This is a uh, kind of a screenshot of their monitoring system, kind of interest, uh, similar to the previous, although a, a little bit simpler system where it's kind of showing, okay, here's this much coming off the roof solar panels and this much is going to the batteries and this much is going to the grid and so on. Next slide. This is before the battery went in. So you can see uh, on the horizontal axis is the time of day from midnight one day to midnight the next day. And then the vertical axis is just showing uh, the amount of power being used at any one time. So they've got a nighttime load with their HVAC. That's in the, the red, and on the left, lower left side is the red uh, consumption at night from midnight till the solar turns on. Then you can see obviously the solar is on during the day. Uh, the blue is what they're using in the building. And then most of that green was just going to the grid. This is again before the battery. And of course the sun goes off at night and uh, the, the red and the lower right is their nighttime HVAC load again. Next slide. Now this is a day after the battery. So what they're doing is they're using the solar to charge the battery. And then they use that power with what they wanted to do is they said, instead of, of sending all that solar power to the grid, we wanna use as much as we can, or at least as much as the battery allows uh, in our building. So again, starting on the lower left, we've got the previous day's battery is in blue now. That battery is discharging to cover those nighttime loads as best it can. There's always a little bit of a delay uh, as HVAC loads come on and off, but it's covering the building loads as best it can. Eventually that battery ran about 4 a.m. That battery ran out of juice or 20% capacity in the, in, the, in the tank. So it got down to 20% capacity. And it said, okay, I can't do this anymore. So they're just uh, pulling from the grid there from about 4 a.m. to around 8 a.m. And then you can see the light green, uh, about nine o'clock there, it starts charging the battery from the solar is the light green. And then that, that battery gets fully charged right around noon. And then uh, again, once the battery is fully charged, it's just sending it to the grid. And then after the sun goes down, the battery is uh, charging or, or covering the loads again of the building. So next slide. Again, this is kind of a before at the top and an after showing how much of their system production were they using. And at the, at the top there in the, the July uh, day, these are just a couple of random days I picked. They weren't exact, but they're close enough. Uh, they were only using on site, oh, back there, yeah. They were only using about 5% of their solar on site and then 95% they were sending to the grid on that particular day. And, uh, and then they chose the consumption of uh, you know, 31%, uh, they were self-consuming. 31% uh, of their consumption was provided by the solar directly and 69% uh, there was provided by the grid in the red. And then after the battery, you can see they're using a lot more higher percentage of their system production and they're relying on the grid much, much less. So again, the, the whole purpose of this was just to rely on the grid less. Could they add backup power for when the grid goes down, they absolutely could. This system wasn't set up to do that. Uh, it's something they may do in the future, we'll see. But the whole point of this was just to rely on the grid less and uh, make that work. It's, it's kind of an interesting story. This, this building, they originally wanted it to be completely off grid. 
uh, and they were asking our opinion on, on, you know, well, we want it to be off grid. And I said, well, how many people are going to be in there? Okay, well, we don't know. Well, how long is it going to be used? Well, we don't know. So I, I looked at him and I said, so basically you're asking us to design a car and you're not going to tell us how many people need to fit in it. You're not going to tell us how much gear needs to fit in it. You're not going to tell us how much it needs to tow. And you're not going to tell us how far it needs to go. But boy, if that car doesn't work, we're coming after the installer here. So uh, that just, you know, it doesn't, unfortunately, doesn't work that way. Fortunately, now the building, this is all before the building was, was put up. Fortunately, now the building has been up. They have some history. Um, could they transition to off-grid in the future? Yes, they could. I, I don't think they will now at this point, but they still wanted to use more of their solar power right in the building. And that was the point of that. So next slide. Uh, and then a little bit of bonus info on a big commercial array. This is not something that I did, uh, but I, I got permission to use these. So this is Werner Electric. It's electric supply, uh, uh, you know, business. They provide solar panels as well as conduit and, and whatever wire to, to a variety of electricians around the state. Uh, they've got a megawatt, roughly a megawatt on their roof solar array, 750 kilowatts AC for you energy nerds. Next slide. And this is a picture of their battery bank. Uh, the energy port uh, is the name of the battery company. I have no connection to them. Uh, next slide. So the whole point of this uh, commercial, and this is common in commercial setups, is, is, you know, that was, you could see from the overhead, that was a great big, huge um, building. They weren't going to be able to provide enough batteries to uh, power the whole building in an off-grid setting. And, and that wasn't the point at all. The whole point of this is to bring down their peak demand. So again, this was these, this is a similar uh, uh, graph to the one you saw earlier from Allison. And in the, on the left side, the dark blue was their max, their, their peak demand. So they kind of hit a peak, it looks like at about, I don't know, 10 in the morning or something was their maximum demand. And then after putting in batteries, you can see on the right side there, the lighter blue, they wanted to keep it under a certain line. This particular line is about 120 kilowatts. And their, their whole point of that battery is to keep it under that line. Now, why would you want to do that? We'll hit the next slide here. And, uh, oh, this is the same picture as next slide. Uh, this is where we get into kilowatt versus kilowatt hour. Now, uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying they make them sound the same just to be confusing. Kilowatt and kilowatt hours, they're, they're really very, very different terms. So I, uh, what I want you to think about is think about uh, the difference between miles and miles per hour, right? Miles and miles per hour, they, they sound kind of similar, but they mean totally different things. Same thing with kilowatt and kilowatt hours. So uh, in your house, you're charged by kilowatt hours. Um, you know, probably pay 12, 13 cents a kilowatt hour or whatever it is. And that's how you're, you're charged. In a commercial setting, they're charged by kilowatt hours, but they're also charged by their peak demand. And so that's where, okay, in a, in a billing cycle, which is usually a month long, we hit this peak and we hit whatever it is, 150 kilowatts. And uh, that's, you know, probably paying 15 to $25 per kilowatt. So do the math on 150 kilowatts and you can see how that could really um, add up. So the point of those batteries was to keep it under a certain kilowatt usage for the building for the day. Next slide. And again, at $25 a kilowatt, you might be able to save quite a bit. So it, again, another graph, a little bit simpler graph, I think to, to kind of show this is a building that, you know, kind of has a, a pretty steady load throughout the day, but then for some reason, at a couple times a day, they have a, a, a peak that, that happens with some equipment that surges or what have you. And then after they put in energy storage, next slide, they've got, uh, they, they shave those peaks off because, you know, they're saving quite a bit of energy, uh, quite, quite a bit of money on their electric bill, even if, uh, you know, even if that means that afterward in that blue line, you can see they got to recharge that battery after it's, after it's uh, shaved that peak down uh, to save them the money. So that's the idea uh, behind that. And I guess I'll, I'll close with saying, um, you know, whenever there's a bright sunny day like today, I look at the ground and I think that could be a source of energy down there somewhere. Ah, uh, Micah, thank you so much. Um, 
I really appreciate that. And I really, I also appreciate and want to say thanks to Werner um, for letting you use their slides and add that in. It's just nice to get a few more different examples for folks to be sort of getting a handle on, hmm, how is this all working? Um, next, we're going to go to Julie Kennedy, um, who is the general manager at Grand Rapids Public Utilities, a role that she's been playing since 2016. She was previously a city engineer for the city of Grand Rapids. And Julie, I hadn't known this about you, but you previously taught engineering at Itasca Community College. I love that. Um, so we're excited to have Julie here. Um, this is a project that has been in the news again recently. Um, and you and Jeremy have both been huge catalysts behind this along with a community group, as I understand it. And I know the project has evolved over time, but we're gonna have you dive in. And then when you're done, we'll go back to questions for all three of you and Jeremy can come and feed in at that point. So Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. All right, thank you, Alyssa. Next slide, please, maybe, and I'll kind of do an introduction there. So yes, I did teach engineering, but my background is civil, not electrical. So Jeremy is the expert on this and I get to do the high level things and then go to him for questions. Um, as a civil, we kind of said, leave the electricals to somebody else like Jeremy. So um, I'll go through and, and do a little bit. Oh. Looks like we're cutting off a little bit of the bottom, but um, we'll do all right. Um, I will go through and just for background, give a little bit um, of what Grand Rapids Public Utilities is. We're a municipal utility up in Northern Minnesota. We do have electric water and wastewater, but our electric service is about 27 square miles. We've got about 7,500 electric connections. And what that means for our load, um, a little dissimilar to the, maybe two of the presentations that we just heard is we're looking at about 31 megawatts for a summer peak and about 27 megawatts um, for a winter peak. And so substantially larger, we're on a community scale here. Um, and so that gives a little bit of perspective for our use case as we move forward here. Um, we do have about 160,000 uh, megawatt hours in usage as Michael alluded to the difference between energy and, and um, demand there. And so that is kind of the background for how we started this project. And so I'll give a little bit of a background and then pull us up to current day. Um, our system, it, we just had a groundbreaking and so we are not operational. So the information that we will be showing you is, um, is the background and then our projections. So next slide, please, Maggie. So, this project coincidentally started about the same time I did. I was actually at the city um, when our local advocacy group, uh, the Itasca Clean Energy team, um, approached the city council. They wanted to do a community solar garden. They would like a subscription-based model. Um, and it was at that time that our city council said, you know what, um, Grand Rapids Public Utilities is a separate commission. They are the experts in this area. Um, the city council turned it over to the commission um, to be able to take a look at that. And so, it was right during that time that I transferred from the city to the utility and met up with Jeremy and we started doing some research with the clean energy team in 2017. We did research on what is a solar garden because I'll be honest in 2016, I didn't have a clue. Um, and then we also did community research. What is our community? What do our customers say? Um, we did some surveys. We talked about renewable energy. Um, and then we had a five member commission that really said, we need to have some significant steps along the way. Um, based on these surveys and our neighborhood meetings, we found that we had a, a large group that was certainly um, supportive of this project, but we equally had a group that was not supportive of this project. And so as members of our commission, they really decided, you know, you know, if we're going to do a project like this, it needs to be self-sustaining. We did not want to subsidize the utilities general or the project with the utilities general electric revenue. And that kind of set our base for our use case, if you will, of, of moving forward. What is our objective? Um, and our objective is how do we meet the needs of the, the clean energy team and doing a local renewable project, but still making it self-sustaining. And so it was at that time that we hired consultant Jill Clyburn. Um, and she prepared a program analysis for us. Um, it was, we knew we roughly had 900 to 1,000 um, interested members in our community. And we knew we could do anywhere from maybe a half a megawatt to two megawatts. And how were we going to make that work? Um, and so 
it was really difficult to make that work in the solar um, subscription model structure. Um, it, we just couldn't get the economy of scale with the limited number of, of people that we have in our smaller community. Um, and so we, we really had to dive into the economics and that caused us to switch at that point from a community solar garden model with subscriptions to a community scale battery. Um, so next slide, if you would please. And so you can see here, maybe, <laughs> um, um, <laughs> very slowly, um, uh, the economics that played into this. Uh, through our RFI with Jill Clyburn and Associates, we were seeing numbers in the $70 per megawatt or the equivalent of seven cents per kilowatt hour um, for solar coming in. And as you see this, our average wholesale power supply was right about that. Um, and so the, the return on the investment for our subscribers was significantly longer than what they we heard that they wanted in that. Um, you, we had to uh, you know try to meet a 10 to 15 year and these numbers were showing um, you know 20 to 25 years and so we said all right how can we take a look at this um, the 7.6 cents there uh, as you can see in the graph that's a it varies over time but on average that's what we were looking at and I'm not sure if the numbers were removed for our energy and demand rates on purpose but <laughs> I will talk about those. Um, that's why um, I, I do have the notes. So as Mike alluded to, very big difference between demand um, or capacity, if you will, and what that rate is and energy. And so it caused us to look to our wholesale power costs. We do not generate here at Grand Rapids. We buy all of our power wholesale from Minnesota Power and our energy rate is quite low. At that time, it was you know 2.6 cents um, per kilowatt hour, and so pretty low on that. And it was tough to overcome those energy costs for solar. But where we really saw the ability to pull um, a battery in was on that demand rate. We have at that point it was $19.48 per kilowatt month. And so to Micah's comment, that was a significant portion of our bill. If you remember, I said we're you know 31 megawatts in the in the summer, which is 31,000 kilowatts hours or kilowatts sorry and 27 uh, in the winter so that's five to six hundred thousand dollars each month just for that 15 minute peak that we were hitting one time throughout the month and so we knew if we could leverage some savings um, from a battery and save on that demand cost that would help us um, overcome the the cost of the solar and the overall cost of the project and so that's really what transitioned us was that was our use case. How do we save on that demand cost? And that transitioned us into the utility scale um, solar plus storage. So next slide, please. So we set out to find a system that would work for us. We talk a little bit about time of use and rate shifting. And as Lisa talked about in the beginning, our solar peak up here in Northern Minnesota is about one to two, but our system peak is more about 4.30 in the afternoon and it goes for about four hours. And so not only we did, you know, were we able to reduce a peak, but we were able to hold with a battery, we were able to hold that um, and store that and, and dispatch it later. And so we needed to go and figure out what battery storage system could we use so that we could shave that peak and um, shift the, the usage or the dispatch of it. Because as we talked about in those rates, for every megawatt that we were able to reduce that peak, it was $19,000 a month, roughly, is actually a little over. And so if we could shave that every month, that was paying for the cost of the solar production. And so that was our goal as we went out and, and went forward. Next slide, please. So that was kind of the end of, of 2018. We decided after working with Jill Clyburn, um, that was really where we wanted to go, was into a, a utility scale um, storage project. And it was right then that Minnesota Power decided to jump in and say, hang on a second, we've got a wholesale contract that doesn't allow you to purchase power from another entity. We have a clause in our contract that allows us to generate and we can do customer owned generation to a certain extent. However, we need to own that. And so if we own that as a municipal entity, we cannot leverage or take advantage of any of those tax incentives that are out there. Um, and so that meant that it was a higher cost than if we were to purchase it through um, someone who had that tax appetite that would be able to take advantage of those tax credits. 
And so um, we ended up at that point, it was pretty controversial in the project. Do we, we research PERPA and interpretations of contracts and, and all sorts of things. And it was right then that we said, we can either go down a, a legal battle or we can join forces and, and move forward. And at that point, we all agreed to join forces and move forward. And with that, Minnesota Power brought a lot of horsepower to the team. They had staff, they had experience in doing solar projects. They were very interested in um, looking at battery storage. And so we went out in 2019 with a full on RFP um, and we opened it up to different sites. We allowed, um, we had a couple sites in mind, but we also opened it up to different sites. We opened up the solar array size. So it was a pretty open RFP. Um, we opened up battery sizes. We had a number of different things and we got back 30 plus combinations. Um, wonderful response, but now what do we do? You know, we've got all these different combinations to look at. And so we put an evaluation team together that still had clean energy team staff, um, Grand Rapids Public Utilities staff, Minnesota Power. We also hired two consultants um, that we worked with. And then we also engaged the Sandia National Labs to do some analysis for us. Now what, we, we know we've got a peak and we know we wanna shave you know, a megawatt or, or more, over four hours, what, what combination do we go with? And so that graph on the lower right um, kind of looks, is one of the graphs that we use to look at what is our optimal size? You know, in this case, the, there's, you know, diminishing returns, bigger is not always better. Um, and so we needed to be able to size it appropriately um, for our community. And what we needed to do then is to bet, you know, match, and you can see that at the bottom, match that best site. And when I say site, we had two sites, um, a couple sites actually outside of the airport area, but we had one that was within our airport B zone um, area that had some restrictions. And so what we were looking at is it had the glare analysis shows that we've got to um, change our, our angles a little bit, which required some more panels to be installed, but it was a cheaper site and it was the best use for that area because it was an airport land that couldn't be developed somewhere else. So there were some you know, added uh, intangible benefits, I guess, for um, looking at a site that was city owned and, um, and relatively inexpensive to, to upgrade and move forward. And so we, we looked at matching that best site with the lowest possible solar cost with the best battery that we could get. And next slide, and you'll see what we ended up with. In 2020, we selected uh, US Solar as our vendor, as our developer. Um, we've got about 15.5 acres of city and airport property. Um, we ended up with a two megawatt AC solar array, single access tracking. It's a combination of Jinko panels and Helene bifacial panels. Um, one of the key components to the initial clean energy team was regional um, expertise and, and vendors if possible. Helene is a Northern Minnesota um, manufacturing site here. And so that was very important to the project. We ended up with a one megawatt AC, two and a half hour um, lithium ion battery from Ziegler. And so that it's a two hour, when we talk terms and things like that, a two megawatt solar array, array with a one megawatt, two and a half hour battery. Um, and that's what we are looking at modeling now. We did continue to keep several of the key components um, of the original community solar garden model. The pollinator friendly vegetation was extremely important to the group. Um, the public facing educational portal, portal was very important to the group. And as we put all of this together, our economic analysis, and that's kind of missing here, um, is showing that Anyway, after uh, the cost of the purchase of the power and the battery, our savings from our demand savings is about fifty to one hundred thousand dollars a year, and so it, it it was a break even or better. That's what we needed to look for. If you remember what our commission laid out for us was a break even or better, um, and so we're showing that if we can hit every one of those peaks as as best as we can, we've got savings um, to work with. So next slide, and we'll talk a little bit about how we're getting into that. Um, we are through the contracts, almost through the contracts phase. We're working on some of the final details. There were some placeholders as, as we learned more about this project. But again, this is US Solar as the developer who's investing the capital to develop that project. They are responsible for the operation and maintenance during that agreement. Um, and then they 
have a purchase power agreement with Minnesota Power, who buys that power that is produced, that solar energy that is produced, and the rights to use the battery through a 25-year PPA. And then MP sleeves that through to us. So that's where we talk about a sleeve agreement because we couldn't directly go to US Solar. Um, MP agreed to sleeve that through to us. And then we buy um, that energy and the rights for the storage at no increase to cost um, than what it was being provided by US Solar. And so the reason for that is again, Minnesota Power looking at tuition, pilot project, whatever you wanna call that, they are learning on a project within their own system and increasing their modeling capabilities for energy storage. And so they were willing to go in with us, if you will, on doing that. And so I'll bring that up. Uh, the next slide is our, our current um, modeling. Again, we are just in, we just had our groundbreaking. We're waiting on steel <laughs> for our foundation right now um, to be put in as far as construction. Um, and so we are, we, but I, I mean Jeremy when I say we, um, fully in on the modeling. And what we're looking at here was just a, a clip from June. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is the model that Minnesota Power is working on for their load, it's load modifying operations or load management operations performance there. And so what, we're, what we look at is for the battery dispatch, we obviously need to take into consideration when the solar is shaving the load, right? It's not just our normal load that we're used to. And so we have to forecast obviously the solar first and that's the, the green line that's showing in there. And this is a week in early June when it started to be hot and we thought it was not gonna last two months. Um, and so we're forecasting this green line um, and you can see in there, sometimes it's overshot um, what, the, what the, the actual load is and sometimes it's under and we'll talk about that. And then the blue is the net load that we've got. So after the, the, the solar has come off of there and after the uh, dispatch of the battery. So you can see the red kind of peeking through in the back. If you imagine the red is behind the blue in the back and the, the red is what the battery has actually in the model. Again, we're not live yet. So in the model is shaving off of that. Um, so a couple of things that we are learning, uh, you'll see on maybe June 3rd that the solar outreached um, or, or was overestimated um, on a production uh, than what the actual load was. And then you'll see again on June 7th, it underproduced. And so I, I brought up earlier as we were starting, today is a perfect example. It was forecasting 90 degrees and sunny up here in Northern Minnesota, not, no rain in sight. And within at least the last seven days that a, a model would be looking at. And last night, all of a sudden we had a big storm come or projections and a storm came through for about an hour right at noon um, today that completely drops things. And so what we're working on now is that ability to overrule. You want a model that is, is um, consistent and moving forward, but we've got to be able to adjust and react to some of those. And so Jeremy and the MP team are working here for the next three months prior to um, being ready to move forward at how do we watch and model what our current load is, what our, um, our anticipated dispatch is for that battery so that we can um, be ready to go here this fall. So next slide. This is our last one. Again, just a recap, um, we started way back in 2016, but as far as the site goes, we, we prepared that here last fall. We did have grants from um, IRRRB as well, participation with the city, um, and then worked through construction and modeling. And we are looking, as I like to say, as a civil engineer, plugging it in. When do I get to plug it in? Um, and that will be here in October, and we'll be really excited to be able to show some actual um, graphing. I, I love to see the Allison and Micah's graphs of, of projects that are actually in operation. We are looking to have a portal. Um, internally, we'll be able to see it through a Power BI format. We're being very careful from a municipal standpoint. Um, we'll look at energy produced from a public facing, but not necessarily the loads. Um, and so really trying to balance what information goes public facing and what stays internal to our organizations. And so with that, I will conclude. This is our, our first municipal um, energy storage project up here in Northern Minnesota that we know of anyway. Um, we'll be doing a, a rather extensive ribbon cutting here this fall when we get to plug it in. So with that, I'll turn it over to any questions and open it up for Jeremy. 
Awesome, Julie, thank you so much. Um, folks, please do put questions in the chat. Um, we would love to have your questions come in for all three of the speakers. Um, maybe one of the things, you know, Allison, you teed up some lessons learned and while we wait for other folks to put some, some questions in the chat, are there lessons learned you know, Julie and Jeremy from your most recent experience where you would say, huh, here's a thing <laughs> to be thinking about that, you know, other folks might not have already thought of. Yeah, I think I'll comment on that. Um, the first one is the amount of time. I mean, we're in this for five years and did not expect that at all. Um, you know, so I, you got to be a little patient, of course, at some point, but the other part of that is it's much more complicated than we, than we thought it was going to be. We thought we'd you know, do research maybe for for a year and have it up and running the next year. And that, in no way was that even possible. Um, but I think we came up with a much more exciting project in the end. We were looking at a 250,000 or 250 kilowatts, just to say, um, of a of a site. And now we're looking at you know a much larger site with the addition of the batteries. So. Uh, I think in the end, we came out with a much, much better and much more interesting project. So. Yep, to that notion, I think we, one thing we did do well was lay out the expectations early of our commission. Again, this was beyond um, a single entity or a business. Um, this was on behalf of 7,500 customers, five people as the commission needed to make a decision. And so we engaged um, those stakeholders early and found out not everybody was supportive of something like this. And how do we balance that? And how do we measure um, success? What, what does it mean to, to be successful? And I, I think we spent as we learned a significant amount of time early on, um, really finding out what does that mean and, and revisiting with the clean energy team, um, are we still meeting the goals of that original local advocacy you know, initiative for a, a community solar system? And so um, we, we learned to read the contracts as well um, and know what you can and cannot do. I, I think I will firsthand say that was, that was on us. Um. That's really interesting. And I know that Ralph Jacobson is passionate about um, preaching about contracts. So maybe you'll get to talk about that a little bit later, Ralph. Um, I see a bunch of different questions coming in. I wanna just read one. Oh, it's getting exciting in here in the chat. Okay, so Vernell Roberts had a question asking, does Grand Rapids have an off-peak program and will the control in coordination of solar or the battery output increase system efficiency? Like, will those things end up connecting? Yes. Uh, you, Jeremy. <laughs> yep. No, that's a very good question. Um, the answer is yes. Short answer is yes. Um, so we do have hot water heaters and off-peak off -peak heating, as well as some uh, air conditioning. And we were recently having these discussions on how do we marry the two together. Um, there's a few different options. It does, in the end, make the system more efficient. But the biggest question is how do we how do we utilize the two at the same time? Um, we've looked at a couple of options. You can layer the two right on top of each other, meaning you would operate both systems at the same time. Um, and we're looking at a different option right now, which probably is a better option, is we assign the solar and the battery for a certain amount of time, and we um, we do our our off-peak heating and different things on the front end and the back end. What that does is if there's a little bit of a inaccuracy in the timing of the peaks and different things, you can pick that load up with your off-peak heating and the, and the other things and it um, hopefully will make the two a little more efficient and that's what we're looking at right now. So. So I think a little bit on that, um, we, through the modeling, we learned that, you know, our peaks are longer than maybe our battery can provide at a full megawatt. And so we're having to throttle that down a little bit to extend it out a little longer. Um, but what happens if you get to the end of where you think is the end and your battery is done and then you spike back up, your load's still there. And now we've, you know, essentially missed that peak. And so, you know, front loading and, and back loading with our own demand um, response seems to be the best way that we can 
uh, model that. But again, that takes time, like Jeremy said, working day in and day out on that model with Minnesota Power. Yeah, I, I mean, that's it's interesting, that sort of learning process. It seems like something that you've all sort of highlighted. Um, I want to um, build on the whole idea of learning and that things will go amiss. And Ralph posed this to you, Julie, but actually I think that this could go to Micah and Allison as well, just about how long the battery vendor would give technical support for the battery that you're using, you know, and how how that's paid for or how they charge for it and then how you pay for it. That's actually one of the pieces in the guide is to really think about like what capacity do you have to do maintenance and then what does that contract look like? So maybe you could all respond to that. Julie, let's start with you and then we'll, we'll go around. So ours is a little different in that, um, we have what we used to call channel one and channel two. Channel one is the developer, US Solar, and they own and will maintain and provide hard support um, for that battery if it's not working. But channel two, if you will, is the operations or the right to have and operate that battery. That is in Minnesota Power's hands. Um, and so they are the ones that are operating that. And when we talk about the cost for that, again, we use words in quotes like tuition. Um, so long as we have a contract with Minnesota Power that we do, they are providing that power to us um, as their learning experience, or sorry, that service to us um, as their learning. So we are not actually paying an additional cost for the dispatch right now. That is part of our project with Minnesota Power. So I think there was a warranty on ours um, that they would, you know, provide um, maintenance and service. Um, but kind of interestingly, in, in the process of getting it set up and teaching the installation class, Chris became a, um, <laughs> Chris actually like started working for the battery company. And so he was able to like do some, I'm not an electrical engineer either, but he did do some like rewiring of things to try to make more output or more storage capability. And so um, we have kind of him in our back pocket. So I think it's a little unique situation. I guess I can add a little in general. I just, I'd, I'd be careful about warranties. Those of us that have been in the business long enough know that a warranty is only as good as the company behind it. Um, and he's, these manufacturers, uh, a lot of things happen. They get bought out, they go out of business, they get acquired and, you know, does that warranty carry through? Does it not? Is it a very complicated question that isn't the topic here for today. But, and the other thing about battery warranties is they're generally very front loaded. Um, if, you know, if you have a battery warranty, it, yeah, sure. They may say, hey, it's a 10 year warranty, but maybe by year 10, you're only getting 20 or 40% of the value of that battery. So, you, you know, the, the devil's in the details when you deal with the fine print there. I think one thing, Jeremy could, he's the one that talked about this, but one thing that we did in our contracts and, and we don't know what it will play out like, but we are, um, there is a limited liability in that we are, um, purchasing only the power produced from the solar, right? Not the capital to go. And then on the battery, it's the ability to use that. And so there's a, a performance guarantee, if you will. And that was a long part of the contract negotiations. Is it a little bit different than a warranty, but similar in that if they needed to upgrade that battery or the components of that battery every year in order to meet that, so be it. If it went, only needed to be done once in 25 years, okay. Um, and so that was something that was advised to us is, is look at the output um, as opposed to, uh, and it was on them to keep that. But to Micah's point, it, it depends on the, the confidence of the, of the company. Yeah, we have um, what they call round trips. I mean, yeah. one full round trip is a full uh, charge and a full discharge. And I believe we're guaranteed 72 round trips per year. Now that doesn't mean, you know, when we discharge the battery, we might only need part of that and whatnot, but it's cumulative. So, and then I think of it more like a lease agreement. You're, you pay a, a certain amount of month, one money per month, and you're allowed to use that car for a certain amount of miles. Similar to the battery, we pay a certain amount per month, and we're allowed to use the battery within those limitations. So, I think it's worked out well for us. We don't do any maintenance on it, they own it, um, and they also guarantee the output of it. So, um, yeah. 
That's fantastic. Um, there are a few other questions in the chat and I'll ask all of you speakers to just take a quick look. Um, I, I do wanna just keep going for now and if we have time, we'll come back to some of these others. Um, but Julie and Jeremy, it looks like there might be a couple for you to field there. Um, I wanna just quickly highlight a couple of things about the energy storage guide. Thank you all. Th thank you so much because this was a perfect way to kick it off and really give some different examples that really add to the sort of flavor of the different kinds of things that people are doing with energy storage and why. And well done hitting on the use cases. Well done hitting on energy and power. Um, those are all things to talk about. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention to everybody about the guide, and I'll, I'll just reiterate for folks who might not have been here that we will be sending out the guide afterward. Um, some of the key things that I think I wanna just flag for people when you get the guide, things to look at. There is a whole section that does pros and cons on four key battery technologies, and it looks at lead acid, lithium ion, redux flow, and thermal storage. And what's really great is that it both describes sort of what they are and how they work, but also talks about advantages and disadvantages that relate to the use cases, right? That sort of why would you want to use it for this and then what that might say about the technology. I understand that my video is freezing, so just go with it. You can hear me and that's gonna be good enough. You can think of me as a robot. Um, one of the other great things about the guide is that there's a, um, there's a really detailed sort of how do you just get started? And, and it's really intended to help anybody who's thinking about a storage project figure out how to bring that to your home or community. And in each of the sections, it has five different sections, it has questions to ask. And so we're gonna use some of those in our um, small group conversation later, but they also deal with you know, maintenance and monitoring and what are you gonna do about that? They deal with financing, they deal with contracts and just some good pointers about these are things to really be thinking about as you go in. And they're all in these green little boxes there and it's, it's very easy to get to them and then just sort of use that to sort of frame your own thinking about a project. There are also three tremendous case studies that give you real detail on the use cases of, of those different um, case studies that we talked about earlier, the kind of battery that's selected, what the sizes are, all of that. So that's fantastic. And then my favorite from any sort of guide is always the glossary. Um, energy is such a wonky, nerdy um, space sometimes, and that can get sort of masked with various acronyms and terminology that just doesn't seem like the thing that flows off the tip of your tongue. So I would encourage folks to take a look at that glossary. It's a real helpful index. Um, and with that, Dan Thede, I'm wondering if you might show, um, speaking of things that might not be intuitive, the first video that we have from our friends at Institute on the Environment, which really talks about analogies for how to think about storage. So we'll show that real quick like. The way I think about energy storage is very much like the cordless phone back in the day or even your cell phone today. You charge it up whenever you charge it and you use it, you power it down and then you plug it back in. It's very similar. And for kids, the way I would like to kind of reference it is for their, their remote control car, right? They take their charge their battery, they plug it in, they go play, and then it's kind of like 40 or 50 feet away from them and it dies. And then they got to go back, they got to plug it in, let it power up, and then they can use it. The way that it'll benefit individuals and the community uh, is much like in the, in the olden days when there wasn't a city municipal water supply, but everybody had to have their own. And so often people would have a cistern made out of concrete or plaster, and it would catch rainwater that came off the roof and filter it so that they could then uh, pump it up to the kitchen sink or for the Saturday night bath. And that was their water supply. So the energy supply by storage allows the community to use a lot more solar energy. For some of us, you know, we used to wash our dishes, right, in one part of the sink and then we would fill it up with water on the other side. I like to say that that's how the battery works, right? So um, the battery fills up and it provides the resources that you need um, and then you, you put your dishes over to the other side and it, it actually goes down. Uh, so just imagine washing dishes and that's how the battery uh, works actually. 
electricity and water are very much the same in, in some ways. So you can imagine batteries are like buckets. And so you can have different sizes of buckets and that represents energy storage. But if you have a hole on the bottom of the bucket, that really represents the power or just how much water could come out right away. So if you need more energy, you add more buckets, right? But if you need more power, you need a lot more water to come out, then, uh, then, then you're gonna need uh, a bigger hole. And fun final closing words from Troy Goodnow. Um, I want to I want to have some time to dig into some things that occurred to me as as questions, um, and I'm gonna invite a couple of other speakers in um, because I am a novice and I don't know any of the answers to these questions. They really are genuine <laughs> questions, um, and so. Um, Micah, you're gonna stay with us here for this next little segment, but we would love to have um, Nate Broadbridge, the head of operations at Renewable Energy Partners and also um, an experienced professional with Sundial Solar. As a fun fact, Nate, is it true that you also co-own a coffee company? I do, yes, uh -huh. that is a fun fact. <laughs> I, it is a fun fact, I like that, okay. That's awesome, thanks for being here. And then Shri Pandey, um, who says that he would describe himself as a student of solar, who's been working in the PV industry for two and a half years. He's got electrical construction industry experience as well and started his solar career um, as a, an operations and maintenance technician and works for Sundial Energy as an engineer and electrician. Shree, fun fact about you, I found out you speak three different languages. I th I'm gonna say you're awesome, you win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank I got a chuckle. Much. That's good. I like it. Okay. Um, and Ralph Jacobson, who is the Chief Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer with Impact Power Solutions. Ralph founded IPS Solar, formerly Innovative Power Systems, in 1991 with a mission to lead the transition away from fossil fuels toward renewable power. I don't know if it's a fun fact, Ralph, but maybe you're you're like Minnesota's solar godfather. I, is that? I think that that's fair to say. It makes me feel old. Well, I didn't say grandfather. I said <laughs> godfather. I that's mean, those aren't the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Daryl Thayer. Fair enough. Well, actually, yeah. I would say a fun fact about me is that I own a forest. And oh. that I am a very passionate, um, let's say, uh, native forest cultivar, cultivator. I love that. I love that, like trees and solar, um, not necessarily two things that you always think of going together. Um, okay, so we're gonna dive in. Um, I wanna just really briefly, um, there was a question from Tom in the chat earlier. Um, and I, I, Tom, this is such a great question. <laughs> and he says, given the history of solar renewables in general, there are systems globally with a history where there are professional engineers, accountants, and others that have the skills to develop, install, finance, and manage. What's to prevent folks who are interested, as with any other project, from reaching out to those professionals who have those skills rather than trying to plow through it um, one at a time? I would describe you four as folks with those skills. So talk about sort of what it is that happens. And this is one of those um, pro tips in the guide. There are also several of the um, pieces in the guide that have these red pro tip, work with a professional. They can help you do this. <laughs> um, so would you all just speak to sort of how does that work? As you as a professional are looking at these projects, you know, sort of what kinds of questions are you asking? What kinds of things are you digging into with folks? And then we'll go to some of the other questions that I told you I'd ask. I think um, one thing that we always uh, think about first, kind of touching on what Micah said in his presentation, um, is just kind of the purpose behind. Um, I think a lot of times um, folks have the idea that, um, oh, they want to do a big project. And um, there's a lot of kind of thought exercises that go into qualifying what that project truly can be. And, you know, maybe uh, shifting from some perspective on what it can or can't be. Uh, and so I'd say that's probably one of the biggest things up front with reaching out to somebody who's done it or has, you know, been in the industry and seen others do it uh, and, you know, get details like, like on this call. Um, 
because a lot of times what you think might be possible may not be possible. And sometimes you, what you think might not be possible might actually be possible. That's what I would say. Sri, anything to add to that? Uh, you know, I just look at it from a very, very technical point of view. Just, to, uh, you know, somebody wants to make something, then I immediately go to what what is the condition and the side condition is. Um, you know, voltage and current and circuit breakers. That That's where my um, thought go. Um, more than anything but we like need to said sometimes it's uh you know somebody wants to do something really big but the side conditions really prevent that um and somebody may think oh if that can't be done here then that may be very well be possible mm -hmm. right and with your technical savvy you're actually able to discern the difference between the two <laughs> most uh Mostly. <laughs> Mostly. Um, <laughs> Ralph, how about you next? And then Micah. Um, sure. I've been studying the markets in other states because um, I, in terms of our growth of, of IPS solar, we are looking at playing in other states uh, and really trying to understand what drives those markets. Uh, the way I would characterize the Minnesota market is that um, it reminds me of the way the solar market was around the turn of the century where um, it was aspirational. And it, there was really was, it was difficult to make the business case because there weren't enough pieces in place. There weren't the right incentives. Um, and, and in the case of storage, um, we, we don't have the, the, the Minnesota, or excuse me, MISO, the Midwest uh, independent system operator does not have the rules uh, for the market in place yet so that um, the pieces for um, cash flow to make the business case and bring investors in and have a replicable market are not there. And so the aspirational market, um, thank goodness for the aspirational market, because um, it, it, uh, otherwise we'd have nothing going on. It's people who believe in it and are going to figure out a way to raise the money and, and make it happen, even though it might not be good business yet. Micah? Yeah, I, I really like how, uh, you know, thinking about this question, I, I really like how uh, both Julie and Allison really framed theirs is, is they really introduced their teams and that this was a team approach. And I think that's very, very important. We're not at the point, at least on the commercial and community scale, we're not at the point of, of true plug and play where we can just say, yep, you just plug this in here and it just works and it, it does exactly what you want because every building is a little different and every business or, or community center or whatever you're trying to power is a little different. Um, one of the things that I tell people that I'm working with is I, I'm not gonna tell you what to prepare for. You tell me what you wanna prepare for and then I'll design a system to do that. Um, so I, I, you know, I get people that are talking about there, there may be doomsday preppers or I have people that just wanna deal with a power outage or they just wanna deal with you know, demand charges, whatever it is. You tell me what you're trying to prepare for uh, and, and I'll design that. I'm not going to tell you what you need to prepare for. But um, the other thing that, two other things that really come to mind when I'm, when I'm talking to people about batteries is, uh, number one, is it absolutely, so we really talked about possibly saving some money or, or in the, the, my case study, it, it was really about just using the solar power on site. It wasn't about saving any money, but uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind is, is that batteries aren't always going to save you money. Uh, there are a lot of cases where I talk with folks who want batteries and I say, look, you're not going to save a dime with this. In fact, it's going to cost you money the entire uh, lifetime of the system to have batteries. In some cases, they save money. In other cases, uh, batteries are a service, not an investment, like, uh, like a water softener is a service, right? I don't get a water softener to save money. I get a water softener because I want the service of soft water. Uh, maybe some situations I don't get batteries because I want to save money. I get batteries because I want the service of off-grid power when the grid goes down. And then the other thing to, to consider, you know, again, as Sri said, really dialing down what, what it is that the, that the site needs and wants. 
there are there are people that say, well, I want to get batteries because because I don't, you know, I want some off grid power for when the power goes out a couple times a year for two hours, uh, and I don't want anything that emits carbon. Sometimes, you know, so I don't want a generator. And sometimes I actually talk them into a generator. Now, all you carbon people that are that are angry with me for saying that, let me let me explain that a little bit. Carbon, uh, a generator, say a natural gas generator that runs for two hours twice a year versus a lithium ion battery. And if you haven't looked into the absolutely atrocious uh, environmental cost of mining lithium, look into that. And then shipping a uh, 214 pound battery literally halfway across the world uh, to California and then, then shipping it here to Minnesota to put it in. It, look at the carbon cost of that versus a generator that runs for two hours twice a year, right? You need to start thinking about the life cycle of this and maybe the low carbon solution for that particular person is to put in a generator. I'm not saying go, go put in generators. I'm just saying if, if your goal is low carbon, let's look at how much is this going to run. Now, in, in Julie's case, that thing's running every day for a couple hours and it's running at a megawatt. Well, that's not a place for a, for a generator, but there are different places, different scales where that might actually be a low carbon solution. So you really want to dial that in. Yeah, that's interesting, Micah, because there are definitely some, some prompts in the guide to really be thinking about, like, do you want to be able to recycle things? What kind of materials are you thinking about? What is that life cycle cost? So that's excellent. And it also speaks to if you have sort of a carbon interest, sort of what to be thinking about. So thanks for bringing those things up. Um, I want you all, one of the things we really wanted folks to be able to understand at the end of this is to understand um, power and energy. <laughs> and one of the things that the guide talks about is the ratio of power capacity to energy capacity and how that influences the effectiveness of a battery in executing a particular use case. I think Troy actually started to get into that with his bucket analogies, but could you all talk about what does that mean about the ratio of power to energy and how that might influence the effectiveness in a particular use case? Yeah, Ralph, go ahead, why don't you start? Yeah, there was a good study that, um, let's see, the Tucson, what is it called, T Tucson Energy, the Tucson Utility, um, did uh, a couple of years ago where they were looking at um, how, to, how can you predict um, from, um, let's say, weather data and, um, well, the size of the energy storage, and you put all those pieces together. Uh, and, okay, you don't know, if you've got a weather event coming up, like a real killer heat wave, and we've seen those recently, right? Um, and in Tucson, they get them every summer. How can you predict whether it's going to last two hours, four hours, or six hours? If, if you have a battery that, um, let's say, has um, a thousand kilowatt hours in it, and so that's the energy storage, that's the bucket, um, and you're going to take it out at the rate of 500 kilowatts, that's going to last for two hours. 500 kilowatts times two hours is a thousand kilowatt hours, right? That's simple math. Um, but what if the the um, heat wave, the, the when everybody is running the air conditioners full out and the peak is occurring, what if that lasts four hours? So what they're looking at is how can they predict um, how bad it's going to be so that they can um, set, set the, uh, the throat or the throttle on how fast they're gonna let that power out. How big is the hole in the bucket so that um, it's gonna last all the way through that event and not leave them hanging halfway through. And, and so that's why it's important to understand the difference between the power ratio or the ratio of power to energy. How fast are we gonna need that power and do we really need it to last through a whole event? Or is it just something we're going to dump at night and it can take eight hours? I mean, the, the different use cases are going to determine whether, um, whether we really need to use that ratio uh, in our design um, or whether we can be kind of casual about it. Yeah. Sri, what were you going to add? Thank you, Ralph. I was just going to kind of um, add to Ralph's point about uh, power uh, because each um, 
battery system, a storage system has a, a limit of how much instantaneous power it can deliver. Uh, you know, sometimes um, lithium, like if you subject it to very high current flow, then it is potentially could be a fire hazard. So when you're sizing your system, uh, you know, you have to worry about the capacity. How much, how long are you going to run, um, you know, your lights? That's going to determine how much capacity you need. But if you're going to plug in your, you know, microwave or, or you know, probably AC unit, you know, that's going to draw a relatively large amount of current um, or let's just say power, instantaneous power. So that's something you want to be very mindful about as well. Uh, just from a small experience with Sonon battery system, you know, they can only deliver about 30 amps, 33 amps. So that is going to limit, you know, what you can run, uh, how many things you can run. So yeah, I agree with Roth, the energy and power. Um, you want to be very cognizant about that when you're designing it. Sri, one of the things that you're bringing up leads me to another one of the questions that we wanted to just hit on. One of the use case descriptions is around providing backup power in the guide. And it talks about okay. doing a critical load <laughs> inventory. Um, right. I see people, I see some heads nodding as I say that. Uh, can you all describe um, what goes into that process? And what is it that people actually define as a critical load as opposed to maybe how they're initially thinking about it? But it is, yeah, it is very, very subjective what, you know, what we find critical, right? So maybe you should, I think like absolutely critical, that's something I really have to have to uh, survive um, or have a maintain a certain level of comfort. But I think Ralph, you wanted to talk about this. Do you want to take it over? Um, well, I remember Y2K. Um, there was um, a lot of people were, were uh, at least doing the tire kicking uh, to see if they could afford uh, a, something to um, give them a little bit of resilience just in case it turned out to be um, true that, that Y2K was going to be a disaster, which it turned out, thankfully, it wasn't. Um, but it, it usually, um, you know, people go into an energy audit, and that's what you start with is an energy audit, where you just look at all the devices in the household, how, what's the runtime, and, uh, and then how much power does it draw instantaneously. So you multiply those two things together and you get kilowatt hours. And so the, um, the, the typical thing people would, would look at are um, my refrigerator, okay? Especially if it's somebody, um, let's say, uh, who had their own water supply like out in the country. And, and we'd have to remind them, well, what, what about your water pump? You know, you can keep the refrigerator door closed and it can hold, you know, the, the cool for um, quite a long time if you're not interested in opening the door and cooling your feet for 10 minutes. Uh, so think about what is really important to you and, and put those at the top of the list. And, and that's, you know, the prioritization. And, and you would find sometimes that that's not um, going to be a, a, a large, um, let's say, an energy load that you have to design for when you really get people to think about what they're, what they're gonna need to go through, let's say a, a two day power outage uh, versus a, a two hour power outage. I don't I like know if might wanna chip in. I like how Ralph thinks about that, about making a list and prioritizing the list because I'll, I'll tell you what a critical load is. A critical load is what you can afford. Really, I mean, bat yeah, batteries have, have fallen in price, but they're still not cheap. Uh, sure, they've come down, but you're, you're still you're still going to want to uh, back up more than you can afford to in most cases. So a critical load is is do do the list that that Ralph says, uh, prioritize it, think about what is first and second and third, and then uh, you, then you figure out your budget and you figure out where on that list you cut it off. And I guarantee you, you're going to cut it off somewhere. And then uh, those loads that are above that line are your critical loads. Um, Dan, if you might 
go ahead and show the video of the case studies. And we will do that as folks come back in and then we'll go to our next set of speakers. Past 15. <laughs> Thanks. Years and energy has been really transformative and focused largely on driving down the prices of wind and solar. The next 15 years of energy transformation is going to be on energy storage. This project uh, is a catalyzing project that will help our partners think about how to do battery storage, energy storage at different locations, different sizes and scales. We are adding energy storage batteries to organizations that already have a renewable energy component, such as solar or wind power. We have started this pilot project with the renewable energy partners, Red Lake Nation and the University of Minnesota Morris campus. So we're using uh, battery storage at the site specifically for first off because we are we're a business, right? And what we're doing is we are seeking to minimize the cost of our power during the peak demand charges that take place utilizing the grid from Excel Energy. So what this does is it allows for distributed energy resources, i.e. solar, on various buildings that are within the community to be producing power right there on site and then it to be stored on site also, meaning that you don't have any losses. And then beyond that, those batteries will operate and be able to do transactions between the, the batteries themselves. I'm really excited about this project specifically because it has the potential to be the first virtual power plant in North America. And for that to happen in an economically challenged community like North Minneapolis, that's a big deal. This is another piece of the training center, right? Where people will come and actually get trained on not just solar, but batteries in addition to electric vehicles. It's a huge opportunity economically, as well as to help to mitigate climate change, one of the key issues that are the most threatening issues of our time. Our energy storage project is focused on the Green Prairie Community Residence Hall. It has a solar PV panel, 20 kW, that feeds the building. And what we really want to do is connect solar PV and battery storage to basically meet the load of the building. The University of Minnesota Morris has been working on carbon neutrality for the past 15 years. We became carbon neutral in electricity in 2020. And what's really unique about the Morris campus is that we overproduce a lot of electricity. We view battery storage as a way of bringing back some of that value and using more of that clean energy on campus. This project built around a flow battery is a much different kind of battery that has the potential to be used many, many times without degradation to be built with materials we can find right here in Minnesota, and that makes it just much different and very exciting. The storage system is a resilience issue for the Red Lake Government Center. Um, we're using it to uh, be the backup power for the computers, um, and kind of what happens is they, they have outages up there, so uh, that backup allows the government staff there to uh, be able to do their work, so that's very helpful for the Government Center. This project is going to lead the community to engage with energy in a way that makes the community much more sustainable. And so as I am able to transfer the ownership of the system one by one into the possession of the tribe, our expectation is they will form the governing board of a tribal utility. We're talking about a community that has a eight to ten thousand dollar medium income. The unemployment rate on the reservation is also very high. So when you think about the opportunities that this is going to bring to the tribal members, is really exciting. So once they get their heads wrapped around this, um, I can foresee people going up there at Red Lake and recruiting these people to uh, work on projects around the around the state and around the country. And I think that I've actually heard that people are recruiting those folks from those projects. 
Um, so that was, was good foreshadowing. Um, I really, I just wanna say again, um, that it's been really great to partner with Akisha on this. Um, a number of the folks who are on the call today are also part of an energy storage advisory committee that Akisha has led and Akisha and Alex Venning, who's no longer with the Institute on the Environment, but was an essential part of this project have really spearheaded so much of this amazing um, work. And of course, actually all of the sites um, who I know have been going through a ton. And so with that, um, Maggie, if you would bring up Nate and Shree's presentation, we're gonna hear from one of those projects right now. Um, thank you both for being here. Um, I'm gonna tell you that I loved one of your first slides. Um, it reminded me of myself and my colleague, Joel, because one of you seems a lot taller than the other. So people will get a good chuckle out of that when it comes. Um, but Nate and Shree, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and everybody else on the call for uh, attending and hope to share a little bit about, you know, our project uh, over on the north side of, of Minneapolis and um, some of the pieces uh, that went into that project um, and some of the costs associated. Also want to share a little bit about somewhat of the, the journey of, of the design and, you know, kind of what went into all that as well. Next slide, please. Um, yep, so, you know, I guess we've already introduced ourselves. Um, my name is Nate and Shri is also on the line. And uh, we kind of spearheaded this uh, for our respective organizations. Um, we were both kind of the point person, Shri more on the technical side and, and myself more on the um, project management side. Next slide, please. Yep, so um, our project, we were simulating a kind of a neighborhood level microgrid. So the building uh, that we were doing it on, uh, the Regional Apprenticeship Training Center over on 1200 Plymouth Avenue um, has uh, solar on it, had solar on it already uh, prior to starting the project. We have uh, kind of two sections of, of the roof, one for you know, what we call the house uh, and the other then for this research project. So fortunately the building had two services. So our first interconnection with 133 kilowatts of of solar was just kind of a pure play, you know, commercial solar project. Uh, the other 33 kilowatts, though, uh, we sectioned off and coordinated um, for this for this project. So what we wanted to do was simulate uh, a neighborhood with four uh, homes on it, kind of like a neighborhood block, uh, and then you know some with with battery and some without. Um, and then the the kind of key piece to it is the idea of community energy transfer uh, and sale between those properties. Uh, based on a couple of factors that, that we sort of programmed into each one of the properties. And I'll let Shri then go into the details on those. I misspoke. I'm going to talk about the details on these. So the first, uh, the first property, uh, you know, we've got set up as kind of two batteries, but no solar. Um, one Sonin uh, Eco 4 and one Sonin Eco 10. Um, and then another property having exclusively solar, but then no batteries. So uh, kind of representing two ends of the extreme and then properties three and four, uh, you know, equipped with a combination of solar and, and battery. Now property three uh, has slightly less solar than property four. So we really wanted to kind of simulate uh, the variety of houses that you could find on a city block with various roof sizes or pitches or angles, uh, azimuths, you know. So um, we've kind of got the whole gamut here and they're all connected uh, via some, uh, an e-gauge unit uh, on site. And they're actually, uh, as you'll see later on, there are three separate, we ran three separate interconnections uh, with Excel. So each one of the properties, although they are, you know, technically on one, you know, physical roof uh, in, in Minneapolis, they actually will be operating like three individual uh, homes with their own uh, production meters. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, this is kind of where, where I uh, fit in mostly to the project is coordinating all the, the pieces here. Um, so the first thing first was, you know, coming up with a design team. Um, and that was in big help with uh, conjunction with the uh, University of Minnesota and the uh, Institute on the Environment. But we coordinated a team uh, made up of, of Sundial, Renewable Energy Partners, uh, Sonin Battery, and then Warner Electric. 
Um, and, and I would say that in terms of um, the kind of keys to success, as well as the pieces of the puzzle, uh, these, these first pieces were the core key to uh, the success in, in the design and, and installation. Um, everybody on the team knew kind of their specifics uh, in one way or the other and came together to kind of uh, troubleshoot, you know, iterate um, and, and kind of figure out the best way to move forward. So, you know, the first thing that everybody kind of looked through was, uh, you know, based on the solar system that we had and the building service uh, and the kind of goals that we had around showcasing what can be bought, sold and produced on a given day. Um, we got into some pretty technical details on uh, on the electrical side of things, um, went through some iterations uh, and then worked very closely with Excel. Um, you know, had to beg and plead a little bit on the beginning to, to get people um, to, to sh you know, get people's attention on it. But then once we did, um, you know, Excel was actually a huge partner in this. I can't really understate their their role. Um, their engineers, you know, uh, shared a lot of feedback. Um, and ultimately, you know, it was the folks that kind of helped us design it that would be ending up uh, approving it through their interconnection application process. So getting ahead of that in the beginning was, was kind of key. Um, and then uh, the final piece, obviously, before construction begins is, is procuring the materials. So, you know, as, as many folks have alluded to, this process can take a long time. So what we first scoped, you know, about a year or so ago, um, there was a lot of changes to pricing and availability. So um, that was kind of a moving target. Uh, but again, having uh, folks like Werner and Sonen uh, helping on the design side of things, you know, they were able to help us kind of um, look around corners with uh, procurement and lead time uh, and ultimately got everything um, procured and on site when we needed it. Now I'll let Shri take it away. Thank you, Nate. We want to move to the next slide. There we go. Uh, so we had a basically four primary decisions we had to make. Uh, what kind of solar uh, PV equipment, uh, the loads, and the monitoring, how we're going to keep track of energy transfer, and the battery type. The very first one uh, that actually came up was the battery type. Um, I think we were, uh, could we go back a little, one more? So the battery type we we're going to use was a redox uh, flow battery, but um, like we talked earlier, things change. Uh, companies go out of business, lead times, um, and we could not procure that that kind of battery. And the next one was Sonan. And Sonan has a, uh, a record of a virtual power plant out west and all across Europe how, where they are um, sharing power between houses and units, different uh, consumption units. Uh, that's how Sonan came to this pro project. And, um, and we went with a Jinko 400, very, it's a readily available uh, solar module in phase IQ7. Those are microinverters, uh, readily accessible. Um, and as far as the uh, uh, loads, uh, the site is still evolving. There are a lot of new things happening on at the site. Uh, so we have so far just identified few circuits that are using constantly um, certain amount of power that we're going to use that as our test loads. And this uh, slide here shows the very first iteration of our design process. As you can see, it's very simple uh, PowerPoint uh, document. Uh, we have four batteries there, um, four, four transformers. Uh, generally, transformers are not needed if we are going to install these batteries at a typical house. Uh, this site is um, uh, unique because it has a three phase power and these batteries run on single phase 240, uh, I should say split phase 240. So to accommodate that we have to have a, um, adding to the complexity we have on the top left, the corner there are 45 modules 
that are not connected to the battery, they're going directly to the grid. And we had to somehow, some way incorporate that in the system. Um, and that's where that uh, network protection relay, a third block from the left, top left corner comes in. Uh, here we are satisfying Excel's requirement for uh, loss of phase conditions, where at any given moment of phase loss could occur. And, and when that happens, Excel needs everything to be turned off or everything needs to cease um, exporting power to the grid. Uh, then going to the next slide, this one is a little more polished and a little more ready for construction. Um, not sure if you guys can hear me. We can hear you, Sri. Keep going. It's a little choppy, but we got you. Great. Great. Yeah. Could we go to the next slide? So, Sri, what if we're we can move to the next the, slide is the nine boxes. The sort of costly requirements to community scale microgrid. Is that the one you want to be on? Oh, Can you see it? Oh, sorry. No, it's OK. I, I think this is frozen for me. Anyway, okay. so the, before that slide, we have this one is a little more uh, complete. And it shows the actual construction that is happening right now. Uh, most of the components are still the same but their interaction with each other is a little more, uh, a little more real as it hap it's happening right now. And the very, the next slide, yeah, there we go. Um, and okay, one point I wanted to make was uh, the, how do we implement this at homes? Um, to do this in a actual, typical neighborhood, that may be a little difficult proposition because uh, when something is wrong with grid, Excel will have, uh, will ask us to X prime to do, sending power from one home to another home. So the place that we could implement it, probably a condo or uh, an apartment building with multiple units kind of close together, the infrastructure is already there. If we wanted to do it in a typical neighborhood, then we may have to think about running our own separate conduits and uh, conductor and so on. And moving to the next uh, slide, we have uh, uh, all the big ticket items that we need to be aware of. Um, combiner boxes. Slide you know, nine. About how the, how, yeah, how uh, utility Excel uh, or any other utility there uh, requiring us to meter the power exchange disconnects that we have to install to make sure things are isolated when needed. Uh, load panels, production CDs, CTs, transformers, possibly we won't need it for uh, a typical house, but if uh, the voltages are different than your battery needs, then that's when we'll need a transformer subservice panel network protection relays that's the same with the transformer possibly if it's not a three phase system three house or building with a three phase we won't need a uh, protection relays and kind of went pretty fast there i think that's um yeah that's so really yeah, great that, and that and concludes I can, I can jump in here. So that was, you know, that, that last slide on, you know, the, the kind of, I'd say hidden costs, so to speak, but, um, you know, this project was, and now if you, if you jump over to the, the final slide where we can show the partners, you know, this was kind of the key aspect of having everybody on the team from the beginning was because everybody could kind of share, um, you know, as we went through the design and, and iterated a, a few different times, uh, could share, you know, their perspective on, you know, the cost benefit or the trade-off of uh, tweaking it in this way or another. So, um, you know, the the project grew slightly uh, from where we began uh, in terms of the electrical components, um, and so that was kind of a calculated decision. 
And you know, we talked a little bit about uh, you know protected loads um, earlier uh, in one of the other presentations or in the questions. And I'd say that that was also kind of a key component of this project as well. Um, that's not quite finished yet, uh, but we've got to you know figure out a way, and and we're you know constructing it kind of as we speak actually. Um, of cycling through the batteries. So if, if you imagine, you know, one big uh, commercial property, uh, and now we're doing this to it on one of the two services, well, that service right now has, you know, quite a bit of load uh, attached to it today. Um, and that gets used uh, for several different tenants that are in this building. Um, so, you know, setting it all up and wiring it so that they all can, uh, so that the solar can be connected to the battery and then all the batteries and, and homes, so to speak, can be connected to each other. That's one component, but then making sure that each one of those homes, uh, you know, is is using the energy that it needs uh, in its specific way. I do that in quotes because we're we're kind of, um, you know, creating these virtual homes to to act like real homes, so that then uh, our data management system can kind of assess, you know, uh, which homes are using what amount of energy at what time of day, uh, and then buying and selling based on on their uses and, and the battery's preferences for distributing it back over to the neighbors. Um, so that was also a very complex process, uh, which added some uh, additional cost to it as well. Well, Sorry. and one of the things, Nate, I just wanna ask, I mean, part of what I think you're alluding to is that there was a lot involved and it really was a project of exploration. And so, almost by design, the cost might be higher for this kind of system than they might be if it were just a more like I'm doing a straightforward use case, but then you're uncovering lots of stuff. Is that is that about right? That's right. And kind of like what Shri was saying is, um, you know, we were doing this on one kind of um, parcel, if you will, one commercial building. Um, and if you're doing this, you know, we were doing it for research. Um, if you were to try to do this actually in a in a neighborhood setting, your cost would actually be much higher um, because you you know part of this is kind of a closed loop uh, system that is somewhat um, outside of the the normal grid setting. So you know it'd be like running for us right. It's running wires between one end of a room to the other. But you know if you were doing this with your neighbors, it would be running you know wires between homes and those sorts of things. So. Um, but again, the whole point of this and working with the University of Minnesota was that this is a research project and that the data gathered from, you know, the buying and selling of the virtual buying and selling of, of electricity between those homes can then feed, you know, future use cases and kind of profitability models as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. And thank you, Michael, so much for sort of adding in a little more detail here about the next phase of the project. Um, you know, one of the things Nate and Shree, thank you both so much. Um, that when we were prepping for this session, you know, we started, Micah started talking about microgrids and I was like, okay, but we can only cover so much in one three hour meeting. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe the next round is to have something more on microgrids that we also have people agitating for residential. Let's go into a residential storage session. So we'll see. Um, but thank you both so much. It's really interesting to see how your sense of things evolved and Shri, you know, sort of the initial sketch and then the more refined sketch and then how that led into all of the different components that now you sort of have list, listed out. Like these are the things that all went into those cost factors. Um, you can't think about costs <laughs> without thinking about how do you pay for them. Um, and so we're gonna close out presentations today um, with Ralph Jacobson, who has been doing lots of interesting um, work thinking about how do you finance these kinds of systems. And so, um, Ralph, I will just turn it over to you to kind of walk through some of the different scenarios that you've been thinking about. Try again. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come at it from a, a little different perspective here, although my background is engineering. Um, uh, in this case, uh, okay, you can, um, let's say, flip to the next slide. So from the perspective of the engineer, there's the design, all the design stuff, and I'm glad people have covered that so much and so well. Um, when it comes to paying for it, you have to think about that, and then you have to think about a lot of other considerations. And um, 
I've always been on the other side of the table from the underwriter uh, in the project or the, the, whoever was making the donation or the investment. And in the, in the case of um, a couple of the projects I'm working with now, um, the capital didn't show up. The corporations weren't interested. The, um, the um, well, the, the, the money that was promised or the federal grant that, that uh, was applied for didn't happen. Um, and so uh, what got me into the, the role of the financer was working with the Red Lake Nation. I did a, a feasibility study for putting solar on 10 of their buildings um, about well, four years ago, five years ago now. And for about a year and a half, it, I mean, it took me um, three months to do the feasibility study. Um, just, okay, how much solar can you fit on the roof? Uh, and how much of the load will that pick up? What does the load profile look like? All the technical stuff. For the next year and some months, um, we waited for um, the guy who was going to provide the money, the corporations that were going to you know, make good use of some tool tax um, scheme. Uh, and it didn't show up. So I, um, I, I thought, well, OK, this is an Indian tribe up north. I know what kind of a terrible history we have with Native Americans uh, and, and other groups. But Native Americans here, I was dealing with. And I thought, I, don't be, I want to be part of a team of white guys that come and promise something to a, a Native American tribe and then, um, and then, it, and then don't deliver. Um, and so, um, you know, they had been kicking around the idea of solar for um, a few years before uh, 2016. But by 2017, um, I, I was, well, I, I was made aware of crowdfunding. And so that's one of the things I'm going to get into here. But um, so just to step back, one of the things I've, I, I, I've been more aware of now that I'm in the financing position is, so where is Minnesota in the market? Um, and where's the Minnesota market to compare to other states? Uh, because um, as I was talking about the aspirational versus the, um, the business case, business case, you wanna make it replicable because that's where businesses develop. That's where teams develop that can do things over and over again. Um, and so I have a couple of questions that are germane to me as where's Minnesota in the market? And then how does energy storage differ from solar? And we've talked about that. Um, utility acceptance, okay, who owns it, who controls it, and then um, what kind of timing um, is necessary to make the solar and the storage work together. Um, so uh, next slide, uh, Maggie. Um, okay, I started going to storage conferences maybe 10 years ago in places like California and New York. And I found that um, most of the vendors at these conferences would find out I was from Minnesota and they wouldn't even talk to me. Why was that? Because there was no market here. They were really focused on trying to sell um, storage in places like Hawaii and California and Massachusetts where there really was a market. And so um, I, our market drivers are, are mostly aspirational. And, and I, when I say that, I mean, I'm contrasting that with what the drivers are in places like California, where you've got a lot of solar installation, but it, the solar is done by four in the afternoon and the peak might, might last until six. And so this utility has a, a really hard time uh, because they've got to fire all the generators up again, um, you know, to, to finish out that peak. Uh, and, and so it's uh, storage becomes a, a, um, the, the best solution to satisfy um, a, a real problem for the utility. In Massachusetts and well in New York, um, there was a moratorium uh, for a year or so on uh, no new gas supplies out to Long Island. Um, Long Island, um, because um, there was more, uh, let's say construction of um, little, office parks, things like that, um, the, uh, the utility had to tell people, okay, there's no gas, so you're gonna have to go all electric. And so, um, well, that was a problem, but storage uh, actually was one of the uh, key technologies that, that provided a solution for the utilities. And so um, that's why I say, if there's pain, um, then um, that's a real, it takes it from uh, good intentions and good policy all the way to utility programs. Uh, another thing about Minnesota is it's not a deregulated market. 
so we have a vertically integrated utility like Excel or Minnesota Power um, uh, and Ottertail. And so we have to work in that kind of an environment here. And that is different than um, a lot of the other states where there is a, a storage market. Um, but one of the opportunities we have as an aspirational market is to align with greenhouse gas reduction goals. So, okay, you can uh, do the next slide. Um, so storage doesn't generate more kilowatt hours, but it makes storage or solar dispatchable. And so it can be used as a capacity asset rather than an energy asset. Next slide. So um, I think I'm just gonna have you go to the next slide. There, okay, so the two projects that I wanna talk about are the Red Lake Solar Project, where we have a battery that is uh, part of the, the uh, three that were being talked about at the government center, which is going to be backup power. And then at the Oshki Ima Ajitara, which is at the, um, it's the Workforce Development Center. Uh, and that's the project that I'm financing. And uh, so the, the parameters here are that I'm passing the tax benefits through to Red Lake, um, but I'm using them to pay down the debt that I incur from crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding was something that I think it encouraged local investment because we could get, when, when corporate money didn't show up and uh, grants did not come through, um, we were able to get people who were really interested in seeing something happen at Red Lake to uh, make loans. I'm offering two and a half percent loans. They're getting 0.1% at the bank, which means that they're getting about 25 times more interest than they would otherwise. And so crowdfunding is um, uh, very uh, attractive to people who you know, are, are, wanna do the right thing with their money. Um, it's attractive to me because I would be paying 8% 8, 8 at the bank. Uh, and by the way, five banks turned us down because it's on an Indian reservation. Uh, I flipped the ownership to Red Lake after the sixth year, um, but because the utilities told us right at the outset that their, their programs and their, their interest in solar caps where state law requires them to, um, to work with 40, up to 40 kilowatts, um, we were not able to um, uh, do anything in front of the meter. And so it all has to stay behind the meter. They, they um, also have uh, you want what you call the duck curve, uh, because most people who go away for work and school, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of power consumption in the middle of the day when the solar comes in. And so basically what we're doing is utilizing the solar in, um, to um, fully utilize uh, a lot more solar. And so next slide to show that, um, you know, we could put um, this much solar uh, on the, uh, that is to say a, a large amount of solar on one of the um, public buildings, but we can only use so much immediately. And so we um, use the solar um, to meet the peak demand. Um, and then we can just uh, um, inject it into the power um, load of the building over the nighttime. Uh, and then, then the next slide. So uh, Little Earth of United Tribes in, uh, in Minneapolis is a, a little bit different um, because it's in, the, it's in the metro area and it is, uh, does have to create a business case because there is a traditional uh, investor. Uh, and so um, it does have to, I think they're requiring a 9.3% IRR on, on their investment. Um, it requires utility involvement. Um, it's in middle of Excel service territory. And so there are a lot more pieces to the cash flow. And we are working with Sonen as well. Uh, here, uh, just like Renewable Energy Partners, uh, this is 212 units that are uh, each going to, it's a resiliency project uh, where the power uh, will not just be used for resilience, but will be um, sold to Excel Energy, uh, where Excel can um, use it uh, to play on the wholesale market as the wholesale market develops in MISO service territory. And that hasn't occurred yet. So that's, that's aspirational as well. But this is uh, one where we really do need to um, uh, see it made replicable somehow, because if, uh, let's say util the utility here, Excel, is being presented with an opportunity to figure out how to take, um, this is 2.1 megawatts of uh, storage capacity um, 
and use that not only for their own uses, but then to be able to bid that into the either the day ahead or the real time market in MISO. So I'm I'm going to end there uh, because yeah. I think that I could uh, I didn't want to get into the berry bushes too much, but those are the oh, that's uh, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a question um, from Vernell in here that says, if battery or the solar is dispatchable, what would MISO or SPP provide for accreditation on one megawatts of storage? Do you have a sense for that? SPP? Um, uh, Southwest Power Pool, um, which Southwest is where some Power of the co-ops in the Southwest part of our state are part of SPP. Oh, okay, right. Um, what... Um, Let's see, is that in the chat? Uh, it is. Yeah, and you see. can always come back to it there. Well, uh, yeah, I'm okay. If batteries, what would my solar provide for accreditation on one megawatt of storage? Um, see, I think that the market is, is uh, not there yet for uh, at MISO for accreditation. I think those things are still being worked out in, in the markets uh, here. Um, so I don't know. I'll just say, I don't know. We could talk offline. More, yeah. And more I, my, my, um, my main experience is uh, having to keep the power all behind the meter. I can speak a little bit on that, Lisa, if that's okay with you, Ralph. Please. I, I think it, part, part of what the question is, of course, it, it'll, I'll, what a lot of this comes down to, especially in a financing discussion, is it comes down to the money. And I, I, Ralph is right, the, the market isn't there yet. I think in individual utilities, there is a market for dispatchable storage. And that's really where the question I think should go to is, is which utility, whether that be uh, Grand Rapids had a, had a, you know, had a market for, for some storage or I'm in talks with some utilities about building virtual power plants as well. And, and there's certain places where that could work and there's certain places where that wouldn't work and it depends on individual utilities. So I think that's where the conversation needs to go is to that level rather than MISO level at this, oh. at this point. Yeah, Excel Energy, I should say that Excel Energy is looking at tiered pricing. I think they're, they're doing a pilot in, in two areas of their service territory. So the, the tiered pricing, uh, I think, is uh, the lowest price, you know, during the nighttime and early morning, uh, and then a little higher price um, on the shoulders of the peak, and then peak pricing. And that's one of the, um, in the Phillips community in South Minneapolis, that's one of the elements of the, um, the financing plan for, or the, let's say the, the, um, the stack of revenues that we hope to derive is, mm -hmm. is selling into that peak. Uh, or that right. tiered pricing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Um, this is just such good fodder for even future conversations. <laughs> like all of these different nuances. And and I mean, so that you all know, Vernell works with a municipal utility as well. And Julie, maybe you and Vernell could even connect around some of the things that you're finding. Um, and Paul Twight is adding some experiences of his um, from Delano Municipal Utility as well. Sorry, Julie, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I'm typing to Vernell now, so. Yep. <laughs> um, so I put in the chat for everybody um, a few different questions and we wanna give you, this is part of our stalling tactic to put you in small groups. Um, I'm just telling you right now that that's what we're doing. Um, we put in some questions and we wanted you to do a little bit of thinking. And these are from the, the guide. And this is in that very first segment, um, the getting started guide. And it's segment one that's really thinking about, okay, so what is the use case that you're moving toward? So I'll pop those in one more time so folks have them because you'll want these when you go into your small groups. So we're asking you to think about for you, what purpose do you want your storage device to serve? What are What is the most critical purpose to your community? Do you have other devices, for example, like solar that we've talked about a good bit today that you um, need to have considered as you go about planning that project? And then based on some of the use cases that you've you know, identified for yourselves, what are some of those features of a battery that you're really looking for, you know, that I want it to be able to 
to discharge quickly, that I want it to be able to discharge deeply, those kinds of things. And some of those you might not know yet, right? That that's that's part of the evolution of a project, but even answering those first two questions. Thanks everyone for joining in those conversations. I would love to have you all um, as a reflection and you know, for yourself or you know, something that really resonated with you that you heard from somebody else. What's something that excites you about the potential for energy storage? Maybe drop that in the chat um, to just give you an example. As we were just leaving, um, Annie from St. Louis Park was talking about resilience and then equity and sort of how adding storage in certain places that need it most was a really important sort of equity and resilience component that they were thinking about that we want places to not lose power where we have critical infrastructure and folks that may not otherwise, you know, be able to have access. So that was excellent. So if anybody has a key point that you just heard that you want to add in, um, it would also be really helpful for us to understand what questions you still have. What are things that for a future session you might want us to dig into? What are topics that would be useful to consider? Thanks for those observations. One of the things in the guide that I thought was interesting is about going out for multiple bids. Um, and I'm wondering if anybody knows of a directory of folks in Minnesota that do storage. I mean, CERTS hosts a solar directory where you can find out about solar installers, but does anybody know if there's something akin to that? Or Heidi or Aaron, any idea if IONE is working on something like that to come out? I see you shaking. Oh. Interesting observation. Lise Trudeau, would you maybe say a little bit more about the thermal energy storage, community thermal energy storage, and what you all talked about there? Sure, we started getting. Uh, well, we started off. <laughs> I have a curiosity about. And I put the message in the chat or the question in the chat earlier. And, and thanks to Micah for his response. What are the most challenging things to back up with, with battery storage? Um, and we were talking, we started talking more about decarbonizing thermal uses, like um, through um, heat pump water heaters, um, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. Um, and then moving towards, well, how could you have a community energy storage system? Well, that's really district energy. And, um, and then that gets into more identifying thermal heat sources and large thermal users that can um, adapt, you know, large, um, the, the heat exchange equipment and the, and the, and the piping and uh, who have big cooling loads, especially. Um, to balance those. So um, that might be a great topic for the future. And, and I would note that um, Department of Commerce Energy Office, uh, we haven't been able to do as much outreach on this as, as I you know, hoped we had staffing shortages. But in 2019, we did publish a study on um, developing community thermal grids or basically connecting up existing district energy systems, let's say on a college campus and identifying potential nearby um, uh, interests that where they can start connecting those things. So it includes, if, the, if anybody's interested, I'll post that study in the, um, in the chat. That'd be great. Yeah, and Shannon, Steph, and I see your um, face and that made me think about Otter Tail Power and the work that they've been doing. Um, with Bemidji, I don't know if you want to quickly comment on some of that. I might throw that back to you, Liz. I'm sorry. Which specific one here? Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. No, you're good. Um, I think that one of the things that Otter Tail has been thinking about is community 
geothermal systems and how do you actually line up the different loads and needs so that you can do that kind of sharing. Um, and they've been looking at Bemidji State and thinking about, okay, so you have some things that you know need more heat at this time, like dorms <laughs> and hot water and other facilities like a hockey rink or classroom buildings that you know need heat at a different time. And then how do you design a system that takes advantage of those different needs and that staggering. So I think that there's some really interesting examples there. Um, we did not get into much today. Um, a lot of the work that's being done among rural electric cooperatives around thermal storage and around particularly their hot water um, and that they have you know, robust systems all over the state looking at you know, how do we do hot water storage in individual household hot water systems. And some of those might be a good thing to come back to too. Um, Mario, that's an interesting point about emergency response plans. Another good one. Any other you know, key themes or questions that you still have that we could come back to? While we wait for anything else to come back in, let me just say thank you so much, truly, for joining us. Um, thanks for dealing with a few technical difficulties and hiccups as we went. <laughs> um, to all of our speakers, I am just so grateful uh, for your expertise and for your willingness to share that with the group and fielding lots of questions <laughs> uh, as we went. Um, I think it's just so helpful to hear from folks in that brass tacks experience. Um, and in our small group, I'll say we, we got to visit with some folks who were troubleshooting a storage system right now in a basement. And they let us see what they're doing and how it's working and how it's actually not working. Um, so that was really fun. Uh, I mean, I know that there are a lot of folks in the Minnesota, you know, sort of solar installer industry that are also getting into storage. And I think that that's really exciting and it's great to see different folks doing that testing and figuring out how do we do these systems? How do we navigate that? Um, and great opportunities to have, you know, folks share their insights and knowledge. We really appreciate it. So uh, one of the questions, uh, or let's say, uh, one of the things that uh, came up in our group um, uh, was I think Vernell asked the question about, so waste heat from batteries. If you have a battery array that um, generates heat when it's charging or discharging, because um, that's where inefficiency shows up, right? It shows up as waste heat. Well, um, when is there enough waste heat um, uh, being given off to make it useful so that you could capture that for um, you know heating purposes, hot, hot water, whatever. Yeah, Lise, I don't know, your idea sort of led into a few more ideas on the thermal side. I think that's another good one, that sort of waste heat capture. So that, that could it. be another, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think you just start thinking about that space and, and a lot can come up. That's yeah. great. And many folks may have seen that um, there is just a recent decarbonizing natural gas end uses report that just came out that is certainly looking at some of these um, thermal side of things. So that might be a topic for a future conversation. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna let people go five minutes early. You've been on Zoom for hours and hours and hours. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. Um, sorry to look like a robot, I, you know, so it goes sometimes. Um, we really appreciate you being here. 